Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are so happy to see you here at our Thursdays at 3 talk. So many familiar faces, which is lovely. Uh, so we are delighted to be able to host Chet Van Dusen today uh, to talk about his new book um, about Henriquez Mart uh, Martellus uh, and the world map at Yale, uh, Multispectral Imaging Sources and Influence. Uh, so this talk gives an account of a project that's funded by uh, the NEH Endowment for the Humanities um, to make multispectral images of the world map made by Martellus in about 1491, uh, which of course is held at the Beinecke Library at Yale. And this talk will uh, certainly talk about the necessity of these types of images um, for scholarship. Um, as a scholar, uh, Chet is uh, largely interested in medieval and Renaissance maps, um, and he is uh, quite a, a notable presence in the field. Uh, he has an emphasis on determining the sources that cartographers used uh, for text, images, and geographical features uh, on maps, and he's given several really wonderful talks about this uh, at the Library of Congress. Several, several of them are streaming on our website, so please do uh, check them out. Uh, he has had several research fellowships at the Library of Congress, uh, at Princeton, John Carter Brown, uh, the Huntington Clements Library. Uh, he's also a board member on the Lazarus Project uh, at the University of Mississippi, which provides low-cost access to multispectral imaging to institutions and researchers around the world. Um, to say the least, Chet is a formidable scholar. And uh, what I admire most about his work uh, is his ability to add just this amazing historical depth to topics that are as wide ranging as annotations in 15th and 16th century Ptolemaic atlases to medieval images of dragons and serpents on the high seas. He's really this sort of amazing voice uh, in the history of cartography. Um, now, at this point, he has enough publications that I'm worried about the amount of sleep that he gets on a regular basis. Um, but a few of his notable books are Seeing the World Anew, uh, which he uh, co-wrote with John Hessler uh, in 2012 about uh, the Martin Valsi Muller uh, 1507 world map in the 1516 Cartamarina, uh, Sea Monsters um, on Medieval and Renaissance Maps from 2014, uh, apocalyptic Cartography, how could you not love that title? It's absolutely fantastic in 2015. Um, Canada Before Confederation, which was uh, a fabulous book uh, which analyzed and contextualized maps featured in a traveling exhibit from 2017, exploring sort of the early exploration and mapping of Canada, so really lovely. And now we have uh, this new book as well. So again, a formidable scholar in the field. We are so happy to have him here. Um, so please help me to welcome Chet. Well, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is uh, a talk about this book, which is just out from Springer and is available for purchase uh, at the desk uh, to the side there. And it's a particular pleasure to present this material here because a map that figures prominently in this talk is Martin Waldsmuller's world map of 1507, uh, one of the treasures of the Library of Congress, and it's the, the library's copy is the only one that survives of this map. Uh, this is the map that will be the focus of this presentation. It was made by Enricus Martellus, a German cartographer working in Florence in the second half of the 15th century. It surfaced in Bern, Switzerland in the late 1950s. There was a flurry of interest in it, a couple of unpublished studies that confirmed its importance and authenticity. Uh, and then it uh, was this sort of great unstudied object for about 60 years. Uh, because, as I'll show later, most of the text on the map had faded to illegibility. Um, but the map was, was sold, purchased, and anonymously donated to Yale, and it's been in the Beinecke Library ever since. I'll begin by looking at the development of Enricus Martellus's world maps over time, and uh, he made uh, manuscripts of Ptolemy's geography, so I'll begin with Ptolemy's geography. 
Here we have a, a folio uh, of a manuscript of the geography. Uh, the geography consists of instructions for making maps, a large database of place names with their latitudes and longitudes, and that's what we see here. There are about 8,000 place names with their latitudes and longitudes. And then in uh, many of the surviving manuscripts and many printed editions of the work, there are the Ptolemaic maps themselves. This is Ptolemy's so-called second projection for making a world map. Uh, so we'll examine this briefly. So here's the equator, tropical Capricorn. So 23 and a half degrees south. This is the southern limit of Ptolemy's world map. Tropic of Cancer, about 23 and a half degrees north. And the Arctic Circle at about 66 and a half degrees north, which is the northern limit of Ptolemy's world map. The map covers 180 degrees of longitude, which is to say half of the Earth's circumference. And Ptolemy was very conscious of the fact that the map does, did not include all of the Earth's circumference. So if we fix this image, uh, this diagram in our mind, I will now switch to a world map made using this diagram, which we have here. <clears throat> uh, this is a world map in one of the manuscripts of Ptolemy's geography made by Enricus Martellus. So this is a world map by Enricus Martellus. We don't see a Ptolemaic world map every day, so I'll uh, run through a few details to orient us. So here we have Europe, the Mediterranean, Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Asia, and it's important to point out that Ptolemy does not know the eastern coast of Asia. We don't, do not have water uh, to the east of the Asian mainland. The Indian Ocean, the island of Taprobana, which is generally identified with Sri Lanka. We move now to another world map made by Enricus Martellus. This is in uh, a manuscript of his island book, so a book about the world's islands illustrated with maps. Uh, <clears throat> a, a few of the manuscripts, including this one in the British Library, include a world map. If we compare this with the Ptolemaic world map made by Martellus, um, so the Ptolemaic map covers 180 degrees of longitude. The map in the island book does not have a scale of longitude, but estimating it covers about 240 degrees of longitude. I've indicated some corresponding points on the map. So what the, the map in the island book includes that is not in the Ptolemaic map is Eastern Asia. So, and specifically we can see that now Asia is depicted all the way to the Eastern coast. If we compare this map with the map at Yale, uh, it does have a scale of longitude and runs to 280 degrees of longitude, and again, indicating a corresponding point there, we can see that what Martellus has added on this map is more of the Eastern Ocean <clears throat> all the way to Japan. And if we think about the fact that we're talking about the cartographic career of one person, it's remarkable that during that career, the amount of the Earth's circumference depicted went from 180 degrees to 280 degrees. It's quite a remarkable advance. And the new material uh, on this map, uh, that is the post-Ptolemaic material, comes essentially from Marco Polo. And it's actually quite easy to indicate with a line the division between those sources of information. So the importance of the Yale Martellus map. Why should we study it? Uh, for three principal reasons. The first is that it very likely influenced Christopher, Columbus think Christopher Columbus's thinking about the shape of Asia and the location of Japan. That's a bold claim. Uh, there are three principal uh, pieces of evidence for that, and I'll just mention one of them, which is sort of the easiest to convey quickly. Uh, and that is that Japan is depicted with, with its principal axis running north and south. So it looks like it's at an angle, but that's just because of the map's projection. And Columbus's son, in his biography of his father, says that his father certainly would have discovered Japan had he not believed that it had its principal axis running north and south. There is no other document from this period that survives at any rate that either says or shows uh, Japan with that orientation. So this is quite strong evidence 
that this cartography, if not this specific map, so it's quite possible and in fact quite likely that Martellus made other similar maps, so it's not likely that the Yale map was in Columbus's hand, but very likely that this cartography influenced Columbus's thinking. It also seems that Martellus's map influenced Martin Bechheim in creating the earliest surviving terrestrial globe from 1492. We have textual evidence of earlier globes, but this is the earliest one that survives. And evidence for that influence can be seen in Southeast Asia here. So again, this is part of the map where the information comes from Marco Polo. Marco Polo does not give latitudes and longitudes for the places he mentions. He says that this city is 15 days east of that city. So to make a map based on Marco Polo involves a very large amount of extrapolation and guesswork. And it's supremely unlikely that two people would do that very similarly. So when we see the similarity of Southeast Asia on Beheim's globe and Martellus's map, it's very good evidence of influence. We can see another good piece of evidence of that influence in Eastern Asia where we have this triangular peninsula jutting out into the Eastern Ocean. Similar shape on both the map and the globe, and in both cases, just lying just north of the tropic. And third, there are striking similarities between Martellus's map and Martin Waldseuler's 1507 world map. And these, this, the, the similarities I'm about to run through were noted when Martellus's map surfaced. Uh, that is to say, scholars thought, well, it seems that Martellus's map must have influenced Waldseemuller. The problem was that it wasn't possible to read the text on Martellus's map and explore just how close the relationship was. So a few words about Waldseemuller's world map. Again, the only surviving exemplar is here on permanent display at the Library of Congress. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a look. Uh, it's printed on 12 sheets. So a printed map, but it only survives in one copy. And of course, it's famous for uh, not just including the New World, but for being the first map to apply the name America to the New World, so the birth certificate of America. Um, <clears throat> so the two maps are similar. So they have similar dimensions. That They're both uh, wall maps for display. Both cartographers take advantage of the wide margins left by the projection to include large text boxes in the lower left and right hand corners. The contours of Africa are very similar. Uh, this is not really, it's not good evidence of influence because in both cases, the contours of Africa derive from Ptolemy's geography. But when we look at the contours of Eastern Asia, which are also very similar, this is very strong in, uh, evidence of influence uh, because, again, the information in this area is based on Marco Polo. It's very unlikely that two people would independently map Marco Polo's geography so similarly. And one final detail is that Japan on both maps is located in the same location, the same orientation, and in both cases at the right-hand edge of the map. So the big problem with Martellus' map, and the reason uh, for which it had remained essentially unstudied for 60 years, is that almost all the text on it had faded to illegibility. So if we look here at northeastern Asia in natural light, uh, we can see a few banners indicating the names of regions, but we really don't see much in the way of descriptive text at all, which is a little surprising given the map's large size. If we zoom in on the northern coast of Asia, we can see here there is text, uh, but trying to decipher it uh, would be quite difficult. So th this is the most legible text on the map in northeastern Asia, and it's not very legible. Uh, here's the island of Japan in natural light. We would expect there to be some descriptive text there, not just because of the map's large size, but also because Martellus himself made this map of Japan, and on it he does include descriptive text. And so the solution, uh, a way to try and get at the text that, that, uh, that lurks on Martellus's map is multispectral or hyper, hyperspectral imaging. 
Uh, the basic idea of this technology is to take a dozen digital photos of the object or, or a small part of the object, each of the at, at specific frequencies of light. Uh, and then those frequencies range from ultraviolet through the visible spectrum into infrared. Typically, each of those will reveal something about the object, some of the text, some of an image. And the idea is to then digitally combine those in a way that, such a way that everything that's revealed by each of those images appears in one. It's a very simplified account of it, but that's the basic idea. And this technology is useful for recovering text and images from documents damaged by fading, water, fire, overpainting, palimpsesting, and wrinkling. So if you imagine a document that's been burned, so you might have what was originally black text on what is now a black substrate. But at certain frequencies of light, those two surfaces will reflect differently, and thus it's possible to recover that text. And with regard to palimpsests, one of the earliest uh, and most important applications of multispectral imaging to manuscripts was uh, to the Archimedes palimpsest. Uh, and so a palimpsest is where the, a manuscript in which the, the text has been scraped off and the parchment has been reused and using multispectral imaging is possible to recover the text that's been scraped off. And there were uh, good indications that the Martellus map was a good candidate for multispectral imaging. So returning to northeastern Asia, here it is in natural light. And uh, I'll now switch to uh, an image of the same region taken in ultraviolet light uh, when the map surfaced in the late 1950s. And we can see that there is text everywhere. This is one of the most exciting images of a map I had ever seen. It clearly confirmed that there was a lot of text on the map. The question was how to get at it. If we look at southeastern Africa in natural light on the left and ultraviolet light on the right, we can see that the ultraviolet image reveals much of the river system that stretches down the eastern part of the continent that's not readily visible uh, in the natural light image on the left. It also reveals uh, other details. Uh, if one looks closely, one sees cities and the, the names of the rivers become a little bit more evident. Another example, here's the southeastern tip of Africa in natural light. And now switching to infrared, uh, we can see that again, the, the rivers, the trees beside the rivers, and some of the names of the rivers become more evident. So <clears throat> multispectral imaging involves ultraviolet and infrared images. So the fact that ultraviolet and infrared images of the map reveal things suggests that multispectral imaging will be successful in examining the map. One other, other example in Africa, in a natural light image, it's just possible to suspect that text is there. Uh, and it's more evident, if not readily legible, in an ultraviolet image. So these are all good pieces of evidence that multispectral imaging would be successful on the map. So my imaging colleagues and I applied for a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to image the map. Our application was fortunately successful, and we went to the Beinecke for 10 days in August of 2014 to perform the imaging. Here we are. That's uh, me on the left. It's Ken Boydston, who is the CEO and founder of Megavision, a company that makes excellent uh, cameras and other equipment for doing multispectral imaging. Roger Easton of the Rochester Institute of Technology is in the middle. Roger was responsible for much of the processing of the images for this project. And we have Michael Phelps, who is director of the uh, Early Library of Electronic Texts, uh, which he runs a project at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula, which is the oldest uh, continuously operating library in the world and also has the largest collection of palimpsest manuscripts in the world. And on the right, we have Gregory Hayworth, uh, the founder of the, uh, our group, um, the Lazarus Project. And it was Gregory's idea to create a portable system for multispectral imaging uh, so that the technology comes to the institution the fragile object, and we're only interested in, in damaged objects, does not have to travel. Here is the map out of its case. Uh, it was removed from its case by the curators at the Beinecke. 
You can see it's supported on a large easel uh, that we brought with us. It's, the map is tilted back at 10 degrees so that gravity holds it in place. Um, and the easel allowed us to move the map in front of the camera. So it allowed us to move the map both vertically and horizontally. When doing multispectral imaging, it's very important that the spatial relationship between the camera and the lights remain constant. So the camera and lights were fixed in place while we moved the map in front of the camera to perform the imaging. Another view, uh, so looking from behind the camera <clears throat> with the map over to the left, that the metal bars there are the, the laser focusing device. Uh, so the, the surface of the map is not perfectly even, so we had to refocus frequently as we moved across it. And uh, starting at the top here, so uh, up high we have the multispectral LED light source. So the way multispectral imaging used to be done was that one would shine a bright white light at the object. White light contains all the frequencies. And one would then put a filter in front of the camera lens so that one would only obtain uh, the image at the desired frequency. So there are two problems with that system. The first is that uh, it bathes the object in, in too much energy, really. Uh, and then, of course, any filter induces at least some distortion. So now it's possible to use LED lights uh, to shine only the desired, the exact desired frequency of light on the object. So it's a really very small amount of energy less, in fact, than if the object were lying in under these lights. So we have the, the LED light source, and we have a diffuser, which ensures that the light uh, ar arrives on the object evenly distributed. Uh, here's the grid of overlapping tiles into which we divided the map for purposes of imaging. Overlapping, of course, uh, so that we could later stitch the images together. Uh, one spends a lot of time in the dark with these uh, colored lights flashing, and one hopes that one's colleagues have some good stories to tell as the computer <laughs> cycles through <laughs> the different ex exposures. But uh, after this uh, long prelude, let's have a look at the results. So we'll begin with this text block in the lower right-hand corner. If we zoom in, in a natural light image, it's clear that there are letters, uh, but trying to read them is quite challenging. Here's an infrared image. Maybe it was helpful with a few letters, but not very. The ultraviolet image, uh, which I don't think is helpful at all. <clears throat> and the multispectral image. So I think this sequence is very instructive, because in the past, people have used infrared light and ultraviolet light to try to study text on damaged manuscripts, and this shows very clearly how much more powerful multispectral multi imaging is. Um, moving into the map proper, we'll begin with the Alps. So the, the map in natural light really is this murky. <clears throat> uh, there's the multispectral image. Uh, there are place names everywhere. This, this, this image caught me a little bit by surprise. I wasn't expecting the place names to be quite that dense. Northern Asia, again, the natural light image, the multispectral image. On the left and the right here, we begin to see some of the longer descriptive texts that I'll talk about later. Japan, again, the natural light image, multispectral image. The text appears, uh, <clears throat> and it looks wonderful until one tries to start reading it. And when I did so, I realized that letters were missing uh, at the eastern part of the island. And so I asked Roger Easton, is there any other way these images can be processed so as to reveal those extra letters? And Roger, fortunately, was able to do so. So here we see those letters appearing. Which brings us to the importance of image processing, or Roger, can you give it one more try? <laughs> so <clears throat> we spent 10 days at the Beinecke taking the images. Uh, but it's definitely not the case that one takes the images and all the text suddenly and uh, magically appears. Uh, we spent months processing the images. That is to say, Roger spent months processing the images. And as, as you'll see shortly, this, this, uh, this map was particularly complicated in terms of the image processing. But the way we generally worked is that Roger would send me images. I would study the text in them. I would make a PowerPoint. 
indicating where I was still unable to read the text, I would send that back to Roger and he would try new techniques. So if we look at India, you can just barely see in the natural light image that near the top of the text, at the top, top of the image, there are three texts, which I circle here. The multispectral image certainly helps, but it's this area that I want to focus on where we don't see any text. Nor do we see any text here in another processed multispectral image, nor here in another processed multispectral image. And yet here, text suddenly appears. So what this means is that Martellus was using different pigments to write different texts in different parts of the map. And those pig different pigments respond differently to light, so they appear in some processes, but not in others. And this certainly complicated the study, not just the processing of the images, but also the study of the map, because there was no one image that showed all of the text on the map. If we look at another example in Northeastern Asia, an area we've looked at before, so here's the natural light image, the multispectral image. It reveals these two texts quite well. But here, all we see are the lines that were to guide the scribe in writing the text. We don't see the text itself. So this is another case where the texts were written in different pigments that responded differently to light. And the fact that some of the texts were written in different pigments is a physical characteristic of the map that one would never guess looking at it in natural light. So uh, we were quite successful in recovering the texts on the map eventually. Uh, and one thing we can do with that is undertake this comparison of Martellus' map and Martin Waldseemuller's and explore just how close the relationship between them is, something that had been impossible for the 60 preceding years. So if we begin in Africa, uh, so here we have a, a natural light image of a detail of Martellus's map that includes some text. The multispectral image makes it legible. There's a corresponding text on Waldseemuller's map. And if we transcribe, what I've done here is underline the words that are the same. So it's the words that are not underlined that are different. So <clears throat> we have, I think it's four words of difference, or five maybe. So we have su substantially the same information in the same location on the two maps. And just to translate, uh, here there are great wildernesses in which there are lions and big leopards and many other animals different from ours, that is different from European animals. Moving to the southeast in Africa, again the natural light image, now it's legible the corresponding text on Waltzi-Miller's map. And transcribing, uh, we can see there are two words of difference, so essentially the same information in the same location. And translating, the Chersidras or Seladras is born here, a serpent that causes the ground to smoke. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving out into the Indian Ocean, we have a, a cartouche, which is illegible on Martellus's map. The multispectral image makes it legible. There's a corresponding cartouche. Uh, there's a cartouche in the same location on Waldseemuller's map. Transcribing, uh, we can see there's just one word of difference. So again, the same information in the same location. It's a very strong evidence of influence. Here is seen the orca, a sea monster that is like the sun when it shines, whose form can hardly be described, except that its skin is soft and its body huge. Moving into Asia, again, the natural light image, multispectral, Waldseemuller. So here it's interesting that not only are the texts in the same sort of latitude and longitude on the two maps, but in both cases they're between these two mountain ranges. Transcribing, again, just one word of difference between the two. Here there are monsters similar to men, but with ears so large that they cover their whole bodies with them. So these are the, the Panotii, this uh, mythical race of, of uh, people that had these huge ears that they could use as sleeping bags. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving to Southeast Asia, again the natural light image, multispectral, Waldseemuller, just one word of difference. So uh, <clears throat> Martellus says here, Waldseemuller says there, 
Uh, here there are many animals different from our animals, different from European animals. So uh, there is in fact a very close relationship between the two maps. Uh, and it seems that Waldseemuller was doing quite a bit of copying. Uh, but I think this is where things start to get more interesting because he wasn't simply copying. He was choosing what to copy. So it was a judicious use of an important source. So let's now look at some cases where Waldseemuller departed from what he found on Martellus' map. As we saw before, the shape of North Africa on the two maps is very similar. Again, that's because in both cases it comes from Ptolemy's geography. But the shape of Southern Africa is very, very different. So as we can see in the uh, upper right uh, on Martellus' map, Southern Africa has this strange shape like a human foot pointing off to the right, whereas on Waldseemuller's map on the lower left, it looks much closer to a, a modern map. So this is immediate and strong evidence that Waldseemuller was not simply copying what he found on Martellus' map. So let's look at the coast of Africa and specifically a spot a bit to the north of where this, this strong difference in the, the contours of the coasts and thus a spot where we might expect that Waldseemuller would copy from Martellus. Uh, here's the natural light image. The, the place names are not just illegible, they're invisible, uh, but they come out quite well in the multispectral image. Here is the corresponding part of the coast on Waldseemuller's map. We can immediately see that Waldseemuller has more place names than Martellus, and if we compare closely, uh, it turns out that not a single one is the same. So as keen as he was to copy the descriptive texts from Martellus, uh, he did not copy the African place names, uh, the Af coastal African place names, and we can imagine that that was because he had a more recent source available to him. So again, Waldseemuller making judicious use of one of his sources. Looking at the Arabian Peninsula, here it is in natural light on Martellus' map. This is one of the few areas of the map where uh, place names are legible in natural light. Uh, they are nonetheless much more readily legible in the multispectral image. Here is the corresponding part of Waldseemuller's map. Given that Waldseemuller had either this map or another one very similar, likely the latter, in his workshop, uh, and also given that in neither map, in both maps, all of the information in the Arabian Peninsula comes from Ptolemy, uh, we might expect that Waldseemuller would simply have copied the place names he found on Martellus's map. But that is not the case. He made an entirely independent selection of place names from Ptolemy's geography. And an easy way to show that is here I've circled on Martellus's map place names from the central part of the peninsula that are on Martellus's map but do not appear on Waldseemuller's. And here, place names from the central part of the peninsula that do appear on Waldseemuller's map but not on Martellus's. So again, a completely independent selection of place names from Ptolemy. Looking at the Northern Ocean, what we have on Martellus is an island with a cartouche above and below. It's now legible. And on Waldseemuller's map, something very different. So there is an island, but it's much smaller. And there's one long text. And in fact, the texts are entirely different. Uh, <clears throat> on Martellus's map, the text comes from Pliny, whereas on Waldseemuller's map, it comes from Pomponius Mela. So a case in which um, Waldseemuller did not follow Martellus. And moving into the Indian Ocean again, there's a cartouche here that talks about a fish called the narco that makes a fisherman's arm and whole body numb even through the line and fishing pole. And for whatever reason, Waldseemuller does not include this information on his map. So it seems we have a case where Waldseemuller simply chose not to follow what he found on Martellus's map. Looking at the text box, boxes in the lower left-hand corners of the maps, we can see immediately that Waldseemuller's text is much longer. Uh, he's talking about the discovery of the new world, which evidently hadn't happened when Martellus made his map. Um, so even though he's talking about a different subject, he nonetheless kept his eyes on 
Martellus for things he could use. And we can see that he's copied that whole final phrase from Martellus. So even when he was taking his map in a different direction, he continued to consult Martellus's map uh, to, to look for things that he could borrow from it. So I want to move now into one of the most remarkable areas uh, of uh, Martellus' map, which is southern Africa. Here's the whole of the continent of Africa in a multispectral image. And here are the mountains of the moon, which were, according to Ptolemy, the source of the Nile. If we zoom in a little bit, uh, <clears throat> we can see that although Ptolemy says that the mountains of the moon were the source of the Nile, that Nile River system uh, continues far to the south of the mountains of the moon. And moreover, there are many named cities in this area. And this is quite surprising because in most contemporary maps of Africa, the mountains of the moon were essentially the southern limit of knowledge. Uh, so here we return to uh, uh, the map of Africa from the manuscript of Ptolemy made by Martellus, where we see that the mountains of the moon are at the southern edge of the map and thus represent the, the southern limit of knowledge in the interior. It's also interesting to compare Martellus's map at Yale on the left with his own world map in the British Library manuscript of his island book. So again, on the left, we have this continuation of the Nile River system and many named cities. On the right, the interior of Africa is essentially empty. So we have coastal place names and a few mountains, but no river system, no mountains, uh, no, yeah, no cities, no really detailed mountain ranges in the interior. So it becomes clear that Martellus had found another source of information about southern Africa. And I suggest that that, southern, that source of information <clears throat> about southern Africa was a map like this one, which is the so-called Egyptus Novello map. So it's a map of Africa that appears in three manuscripts of Ptolemy's geography. Ptolemy's geography was updated in various ways. So people in the 15th and 16th century recognized that Ptolemy's geographical data was about 1,200 years old and that, that it was simply out of date. And so manuscripts and printed editions of the geography were updated in various ways, including the addition of more modern maps. And this is precisely one of those maps. So it's the uh, new map of Egypt, if you will. And reorienting it with north at the top so that uh, everything is a little bit more familiar, we have the Mediterranean, the Nile Delta, the Red Sea. At the bottom, part of the Southern Ocean. So <clears throat> this map is, is showing almost the whole north-south extension of the continent. And many named cities in the south. If we zoom in, we can see just how dense they are. And the river system, uh, again, continues quite far to the south. And if we put the two maps side by side, on the Egyptus Novello map on the left, <clears throat> the, the river system runs off the right-hand edge. And we can see that at the corresponding point of Martellus's map, the rivers are doing something very similar. And in fact, many of the names uh, of the cities on Martellus's map correspond with names on the Egyptus Novello map. So that's very strong evidence of influence. It's thought that the information on the Egyptus Novello map uh, was transmitted to Europe by quote unquote Ethiopian delegates to the Council of Florence in 1441 to 43. We have very clear records that there were Ethiopian delegates there, and Ethiopian means basically Africa south of Egypt. And we have records that they were questioned about the geography of their homeland. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the questioners, when they heard the replies, said, well, what you say does not agree with Ptolemy, so you must be wrong. <laughs> but it's easy to imagine that there were other people a little bit more open-minded uh, who questioned them in more detail. And in fact, we have a nice confirmation that the geographical information on these maps, uh, on Martellus's map, comes from Ethiopian sources. 
So if we look at the southeastern tip of Africa, we can see that there's a barrier of mountains and a channel running across that essentially separate uh, this peninsula from the rest of the continent. And if we compare that with Framaro's world map of circa 1455, uh, which is in the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, and I've, it's oriented with south at the top. I've rotated it to make things a little bit more familiar. We see Europe and Africa there. The, the part I want to focus on is southern Africa. And if we look at the southeastern tip of the continent, we can see that it has this channel running across it, separating that tip from the rest of the continent, <clears throat> which is very, very similar, strikingly similar to what we see on Martellus's map. And in fact, Fra Mauro says explicitly that his depiction of southeastern Africa comes from Ethiopian sources. It, people from Ethiopia came to Venice and he uh, obtained his, uh, rendered uh, southeastern Africa according to their descriptions. So the fact that, Martellus, that Fra Mauro's depiction comes from Ethiopian sources confirms that what we see on Martellus' map also comes from Ethiopian sources. Uh, the really exciting thing about what we have in Martellus' map is that on, on the left in the Egyptus Novello map, the, the, we don't see the eastern part of the continent. It's cut off by a meridian. Whereas Martellus extends that geography further to the east, we see the whole uh, southeastern part of the continent. And thus it seems that Martellus was working from a more complete version of the same information and it seems to be the only more complete version of that information that survives, which is to say that Martellus's map has sort of buried within it a map of southern Africa according to African sources from the 15th century, which in terms of the cartographic history of Africa is something really remarkable. So a few conclusions. Uh, one of the exciting things about this project is precisely that this map that was this great unstudiable object for 60 years is now studiable in all its aspects. Um, eventually, all of the images generated by this project, uh, both the raw data and the processed multispectral images will be made freely available on the Beinecke's website. And so I came to the map with my questions, but I'm eager for other people to come to it with theirs which is precisely what that will enable. It will also make it possible uh, as new multispectral, new processes uh, for uh, working with multispectral images are developed, it will make it possible for scholars to reprocess the, the raw data and pull more information from the map without the map itself having to be disturbed. I think it's very exciting to be able to compare the Martellus and Waltzmuller maps at long last and part of that is that when we can see how Waltzmuller made use of one of, most of, one of his most important sources, um, it gives us an insight into how he went about making a map. So we don't have diaries, we don't have workshop journals from cartographers of that period, but when we can see what parts of the Martellus map Waltzmuller made use of, which parts he didn't, it gives us some insight into his, uh, his methods for making a world map. And finally, the fact that the Martellus map contains within it this map of Southern Africa according to African sources is very exciting. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. I believe there was some symposium at the library a couple of years ago in which uh, there was another library that has a copy of the Waltzmuller map. Or is that, could you talk about what that relationship is? Because it had the America. On That's it. right. So what is that other one? It's the, the Stevens Brown map at the John Carter Brown Library. Okay. And uh, there's great dispute about when exactly it was printed. So it came from Waltzmuller's workshop, uh, and it's a map very similar to the world map in his 1513 edition of Ptolemy, 
But the, 15th, the, the production process of the 1513 edition of Ptolemy was, was very long. And the argument has been made that that map was printed before Waldtemuller printed his 1507 map. Um, I, the, the arguments are, are very subtle. Uh, and to my mind, they're, they're not strong enough to overturn the Library of Congress's claim to have the earliest printed map that has the name America. Uh, you, you'll have to give me a little bit more. <laughs> so well, you mean, I mean they have they have a 1507 copy of this book with the full fold out map intact in the Elkins collection. So okay, well I will have to have a look at that. So is is the book in question the Cosmographia Introductio? It is. Okay, I will have a look at that. And I'm very familiar with the map, but I just started working at the Library of Congress, so I have not seen this <laughs> copy that's on display. So okay. I, I don't know if I'm being like you and saying that there is another. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I didn't know if you had seen it or not. And so maybe there's something wrong with it. Or, but um, it, it was just considered uh, one of its treasures. So okay. they're not very good at telling people what they have. So okay. I'm not surprised. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'd be grateful to learn more about it. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you for your stimulating remarks. And uh, I'm glad that you got your uh, funding from NEH. Uh, in 2014. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So the shared texts, um, do they only exist in those two places that you know of? Uh, there, there are later maps that copy some of Baltimore's texts. Uh, and, well, I had always assumed they were copied from Baltimore. It's possible they were copied from another version of Martellus's map, but um, there, there are other, but I, but I think they're they're simply copies uh, rather than yeah. Yes. Regarding Southeast Africa. Yes. The parts that are on this map that are not on Walter Miller, did he have the names from these from that from the foot extension? Um, did Walter Miller have those yes. names? He does not. No, there, there are, in southern, the coast of southern Africa, yes, there are some, uh, some names that are the same, but uh, I'm trying to remember. Southeastern Africa, I don't, the, the coastal place names, I don't think there are any coastal place names in that southeastern tip. And even going up the eastern coast of uh, Africa on the Martellus map, there are relatively few place names. But I don't, I don't remember whether there's much crossover there. Well, he, what he was doing was uh, making a judgment that he knew he had something more recent. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any idea what caused such dramatic fading or what pigments there were on the map? I don't, and we, it, it would have been wonderful to incorporate that work into our project. Uh, we weren't able to do so. We were also not able to see the back of the Martellus map, uh, which would have been very illuminating. But the, the way it's been mounted, that just was not possible. Um, yeah. Yes? So this is a more of a technical question. You said that you, uh, the thing was easel at 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you had a stationary camera. Yes. You move the camera vertically and horizontally. We, used the, we move the map vertically and horizontally. So how do you keep a kind of consistent plane of view on the map if your map is angled? So uh, the, the, the camera was angled as well. So, uh, so the, the, the focal plane of the camera was parallel to the surface of the map. Is the Lazarus project working on anything interesting these days? I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> so the, the globe that I showed, the earliest surviving terrestrial globe, is another great candidate for multispectral imaging. It's suffered a lot of damage and uh, sort of misguided restorations over the years. 
um, and we have uh, negotiated access to image it so it's just at this point it's just a matter of obtaining the funding so that's a very exciting prospect where is that room? in the German National Museum in Nuremberg how many images how many images did you all take of the moment? that's a good question so we actually imaged the entire map twice uh, because Negotiating the access is, takes its time, it's difficult. Getting the people and the equipment there costs money, and you want to be absolutely sure that everything goes right. Um, and so we, after imaging the whole map once, we made a few adjustments on the exposures uh, and imaged the whole map again. And having done it once, things went more quickly and smoothly. Um, uh, but so I, I'm trying to remember the exact number of photos of images we took for each tile. So it's 55 tiles. We did each tile twice. And in addition to the, I believe it was 14 uh, multispectral images, we also took some images with raking light. Uh, so we're talking about several hundred images. And then the number, the total number of images generated by the project becomes higher when you include the processed images. So some parts of the map were very challenging. The islands in Southeast Asia, we, we still don't have images that successfully reveal all the text. And Roger, in his generosity, has tried everything he can think of. Um, and so we have many, many different uh, processed images of those islands, also of Japan, uh, and there's, there's certainly absolutely no reason to discard any of those. Um, so it, the, the total archive is yeah, many gigabytes. Did the raking light by any chance reveal anything significant that the multispectral did not? Uh, it didn't. It, in terms of uh, having uh, an image of the whole map that's nice to look at, it's great to have some of the texture, but it wasn't helpful in revealing text. When you say you're waiting for funding or something, what kind of money are you talking about? You mean the amount? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, not, no, not, okay. yeah. yes, the amount. Yeah. So, so for, for this project, uh, I believe the grant was for $53,000. Um, and so the, the Lazarus Project provides the, the equipment uh, for free. Uh, so the essential costs are transport and lodging, really. Um, for the Beheim Globe, I'm trying to remember, we do have a budget for it, but the, the number is not coming to mind. It's a bit more because the travels to Germany. It's a bit more because the globe is very complicated. Um, it's not possible to remove it. It's metal stand entirely, and the globe does not rotate freely within that stand. So that, that one will be much more challenging, and so we've budgeted more time for it. What is that globe again? The name of the cartographer is Martin Bechheim. Uh, it was made in 1492, and again, it's in the, the German National Museum in Nuremberg. Could you talk a little bit about the negotiation process and how you convince or persuade the institutions to mm -hmm. let you image their materials? Yes. Um, <laughs> So really, the, the, the key to that is showing work that we've already done. Okay. And uh, for some, it, it, the, I guess the difficult part is the very beginning of the negotiations. When you first start talking about the fact that we want to bring all this equipment to your library and sort of come in and, and not touch, but work with your most valuable treasure there's naturally resistance. But then once you, that, that discussion gets to the point where you can show images, that tends to change the, the tenor of the discussion. Yes. What sort of framing was it in for, you know, you said you were looking for framing for imaging? Uh, not framing, it's a, it's a case. case. So it was it like an epoxy casing or just a standard case? Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's all plexiglass. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, does that yeah. suffice? Okay. Yes. Who owns the rights to the images? Is it uh, your, your, your group or is it the institution that owns the underlying map? Wonderful question. And so when we do a project, uh, we do not own the images. They all belong to the institution. And 
Uh, with some grants, uh, there's a requirement that the images be made publicly available. But of course, the institution has to agree to that before permitting the project to move forward. But we do not own the images. Were there uh, any overlapping sections that uh, gave you uh, clues that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Uh, what do you mean exactly? <clears throat> I'm just wondering that <clears throat> the way you sectioned it out, uh, uh, would it have been uh, uh, less fruitful to you to, uh, to have uh, gone through the process? With different partitioning? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, any, any way you partition something like this, it will be inconvenient at some point. Um, but the, the, the matter of the processing of the images and the fact that I would ask Roger, is there anything we can do to bring out something here? And he would try something and another text would appear over here. That went on and on and on. Um, and uh, so, and it was always surprising. <laughs> Yeah, so um, certainly Southern Africa uh, was the most exciting for me, and it was, <clears throat> I wasn't expecting that Southern Africa would be that rich. You don't get a, much of a clue of that looking at it in natural light. And in particular, in Southern Africa, uh, there's the city of Prester John, mm -hmm. and that, that surprised me, uh, particularly as on Waldseemuller's map, Prester John is in Asia. So another interesting difference between the two maps. Not obvious, but is there a scholarly consensus today on the Yale Vinland map? I, I, I think the consensus is that it's a forgery. I, I believe it's on exhibition at uh, Mystic Seaport. Is yeah. it like an ancient forgery or a new forgery? Uh, early 20th century, yeah. Yes, that, that was how that was uh, detected, yeah. Hmm. So, yes. Is there any um, ideas of why Cousin would put water on the West Coast? Um, there, there are ideas. Um, so it is occasioned speculation. So the question is why, before the European discovery of the Pacific, why does Waldseemuller show water to the west of the New World? Um, one idea is that this indicates some sort of pre-discovery of the Pacific, so an unknown voyage managed to get around South America and, and see this ocean. I really think it's just a deduction on Baltimore's part. So um, Marco Polo says that Japan is an island. If Japan is not the same as the New World, then there has to be water between them. I think it's that simple. Yeah, so in this case, Ethiopia means very vaguely Africa south of Egypt. Uh, and so we have, <clears throat> we have uh, written evidence that there were quote unquote Ethiopian delegates at the Council of Florence. Um, and they were in Jerusalem uh, when they heard about the, the fact that the Council of Florence would take place. And they thought since they were not that far from it at that point, they should attend. Um, and as I said before, they were, we know that they were questioned about the geography of their homeland. Um, and that seems to be the source of the, the place names in Southern Africa. There was actually a surprising amount of uh, <coughs> exchange between Ethiopia and Europe in the 15th century, uh, more than we would expect. So there are, and one bit of evidence of that is from Auro saying that he had Ethiopian uh, he questioned Ethiopian people in Venice, but there's much more. So there are other possible ways the information could have gotten to Europe, but the Council of Florence seems most likely. Is there any question about um, the authenticity or the age of the manuscript annotations? Like, could things have been added at different points, or are you assuming that it was all in one production? I, I did not see any evidence of later editions. Um, mm -hmm. The handwriting's consistent. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that looked 
fading is consistent. The, the fading is certainly consistent, yes. <laughs> so I, I didn't see any evidence of that. 